Welcome to the DNA of the news, where we take you beyond the headlines. I am Pocho Salcedo from New York, and I'm glad you're joining us from cities across the Americas and Hawaii. In this episode, we will explore some of the most important stories happening worldwide. Stay tuned for in-depth coverage and commentary. Football, also called soccer, in all its expressions, is one of the most recognized phenomena on our planet. Its global penetration exceeds that of the United Nations or the Internet. The points of contact between this sport and national and international politics are frequent and complex. Often nation states send messages to their country and the world through football. Today, we will discuss that and much more with a recognized world-class expert. Professor Simon Chadwick, welcome to the DNA of the news. Thank you for inviting me here. Simon Chadwick is a researcher, writer, academic, consultant and speaker with more than 25 years experience in the global sport industry. His work focuses on the geopolitical economy of sport. He co-founded and co-directs the China Soccer Observatory, University of Nottingham, UK. He is founding editor of GeoSport, a digital sports platform created with the French Institute for International and Strategic Affairs. Chadwick previously founded and directed the University of London's Birkbeck Sports Business Centre, and Coventry University's Centre for the International Business of Sport. In addition, he has worked at several of the world's most prestigious business schools, such as EASE in Spain, Otto Biesheim in Germany, Tsinghua in China, Coped in Brazil and Waseda in Japan. Well, uh, let us jump right away to the deep end of the pool. You wrote a great article on Pelé. Tell us your thoughts and what Pelé represented to the soccer of 50 years ago. Perhaps looking at his career and uh, his time, we might be able to start understanding the changes in football economics and politics. How are his times different from the present scenario of megastars like Messi, Ronaldo, Mbappe, etc.? I guess for me personally, Pelé is the first global superstar that I remember. Um, I, I do recall my father sitting me down in front of the TV when I was very young and saying, watch the 1970 World Cup. And uh, me thinking, well, why is he forcing me to do this? And here I am now, uh, quite a while later, understanding why he did that. Um, but of course, Brazil 70 was, uh, was a classic team and, and Pelé was the... Uh, um, the personification of Brazil 70. And I guess in, in many ways, even today, this kind of sexy Brazil, uh, as, as it was um, back then, as, as the team appeared to be, this is a, a moniker or a label that has not only stuck with the Brazilian national football team, but I think as, as, as a brand for the country, um, almost uh, you know, joyous, uninhibited, um, you know, kind of sunshine beach football, and, and in many ways, that that resonates for people across the world, because for most of us, we recall a time from our childhood when we just kicked a ball and that was it. Uh, there was no money involved. There was no politics involved. It was just sunshine and smiles and, and uninhibited football. So in that respect, I think that, that Pelé, uh, even today, um, even at the point of his death, embodied the pleasures and the joys of of. of, of watching or playing football what i think is striking about him is is obviously he moved to the united states and in some ways that was uh that was foretelling the commercial development of of football and certainly the last quarter of the 20th century and the first uh, decade of the 21st century that commercialization of, of football that, that really flowed out of the United States, not necessarily out of football itself, but I think about out of sport more generally, was a was a, a very US driven phenomenon. So shirt sponsorships and stadium naming rights deals and TV broadcasting deals, you know, you you name it. You know, that, that didn't come out of Europe, that came out of the United States. And, and so Pele, Pele going there was was a, was a forerunner to that. Um during his later years, obviously, he, he was associated in, in some respects with uh, political campaigns. And, and um, you know, certainly if you look at his associations with, with, with countries across the world, 
Uh, we know that he traveled to, for instance, the Gulf region. Uh, what we now know is, is that certainly over the last 10, 15 years, football has become not necessarily more political, I, you know, I would argue more geopolitical. And if we think about the rise of Qatar, the rise of Saudi Arabia, of Abu Dhabi and, 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 and other countries, again, you know, at the time, perhaps when Pele was visiting such countries, we, we maybe didn't think what would happen. Um, but again, I think Pele was a forerunner in that respect, you know, alerting us to what was to come. But of course, if, if Pele was still here today and we were to ask him, you know, so how is it with football right now? Uh, the stories that he might recount of the joyous sunshine football that we mentioned right at the very beginning, um, you know, he would probably focus on that and maybe talk far less more about the business and politics of football. But unfortunately for people like me, and what we've got now is a is a sport that is very very different, and 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 Pele in some respects is the thread that cuts across the entirety of all that. Do you agree with Sepp Blatter, uh, president for seventeen years of FIFA, that if the twenty twenty two World Cup had gone to the USA, none of the investigations on FIFA, uh, his ousting will have taken place? Is this part of uh, football and geopolitics and corruption all intersecting together? My immediate response to that is, is that this was a much more complex issue than, than simply one of bribes to a small number of, of officials alone. Uh, FIFA has had a governance problem, uh, and certainly it had a governance problem for, for, for many years. And inevitably, those governance issues were, were going to be brought to a tipping point sooner or later. And, and really, for FIFA, Qatar was its tipping point. Um, if, if the United States had won and Qatar hadn't, although I think that was always going to be extremely unlikely, um, then you know, perhaps it would have been 2015 or maybe 2020 or maybe 2023. Who knows? But we now live in a world where Certainly in, in the global north, in, in the United States and, and northern Europe, increasingly people are, are expecting particular standards of governance amongst the organizations with which we engage. And so questions would have continued to be asked. Sponsors, and, I, and I'm thinking about some of the U.S. sponsors in particular, would, would I think, not have countenanced any longer some of the corrupt and illegal behavior that was taking place inside FIFA. So I, I, I think it, it's somewhat naive of Blatter to, to say that this, this would never have happened. The tipping point was going to come sooner or later. But what I do find interesting is, is that in tw even in 2010, the world was changing significantly because we we'd already seen globalization. Uh, from 1992 onwards, you know, essentially communism lost, capitalism won. Uh, we, we'd seen the rise and reformation of, of China. Um, but at the same time, we also saw Gulf nations beginning to think more strategically about how they invest in the world. And, and I think especially when it comes to Qatar, Qatar didn't bid to stage the World Cup for reasons of status or largesse or altruism alone. There were very there was a very clear strategic purpose for Qatar to bid for the tournament, which you know, essentially was around nation building. And what I think FIFA failed to do is it failed to explain to the world that you know, the Europeans and the South Americans can't always host all the tournaments. And we'd already had a sense of that, I think, with South Africa and Japan, South Korea. But again, it was inevitable that sooner or later, the the Arab world, and by the Arab world, I'm re referring to the Middle East and North Africa, sooner or later, the Arab world was bound to have to host the World Cup because there are a huge number of people, upwards of 600 million people living in the Middle East and North Africa. Many of them are massively passionate about football. Uh, other sports are also changing its global approach. Hundreds of millions of viewers in India have shifted the balance of power in cricket, uh, which was traditionally in uh, sitting in England and uh, Australia. Formula One, which is also very globalized, uh, has an extensive international footprint, uh, sends uh, the racers all around the world. And uh, you just mentioned it, uh, uh, the Middle East. Uh, 
but the Saudis also are impacting the PGA tours with their uh, very massive pay incentive. So this arena is changing uh, the sports all around. Perhaps globalization has a lot to do with that. You know, essentially, global motorsport was governed by a European. Uh, global motorsport had its headquarters in Europe. The teams were predominantly European. Uh, the sponsors often were European. Most of the drivers were European. And we might have one or two races in South America, and we might have one or two drivers from South America too. And, and I just gave a couple of examples. If we look at the Formula One calendar now, most of the races are not in Europe anymore. Uh, the governing body of World Motorsport, its new president is from Kuwait. We look at a team like McLaren, for instance, 65% owned by the Bahrain Sovereign Wealth Fund, 35% owned by the Saudi Arabian Sovereign Wealth Fund. Uh, you have races in places like um, you know, South Korea and Singapore and, and um, up until fairly recently in Russia too. And you know, you go back to the days of Fittipaldi and Reutemann, you know, who could have imagined that the Soviet Union might one day um, in some form host a Formula One race? So it is about globalization. Uh, that is one part of it. I think it's also about the influence that capitalist economic systems have had upon, upon sport, particularly as I referred to earlier in, in the last quarter and first decade of the 21st century. But what we should also not forget is the role that digitalization has played. Because with the with the growth of the internet, and with that has obviously come social media, but increasingly two new models of, of, of broadcasting and sharing content, this has changed not just Formula One, but as you've rightly pointed out, lots of other sports too, and 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 golf is 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 a, is one that is in the spotlight right now. Uh, the, the, things have really changed dramatically, not just through globalization, but through digitalization too. And 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 this is being given, I think, is being given. If we can use a a, a motor racing metaphor, it's being turbocharged by the geopolitics of of, of Formula One. Uh, notably, countries like Saudi Arabia are investing very, very heavily within the sport. And this conversation will continue after this very short break. And we are back with Professor uh, Simon Chadwick. He joins us from Paris, France. Simon, uh, the U.S. in the 1970s used ping pong as a tool of diplomacy. Uh, it restarted the relationship with China. The two Koreas had a joint team in the 2018 Winter Olympics in South Korea. And uh, the soccer games between U.S. and Mexico or Bolivia versus Chile, England versus Scotland, to mention some, are really politically and geopolitically charged. Tell us why soccer is so connected to uh, geopolitics worldwide. So I think the first thing that we, we've, we've, we've got to retain a belief in is that, that football um, serves a social purpose, that football can deliver a good for the world. And if we we think about all the all the people we ever met through football, you know, all the places we saw, all the things that we did, you know, it's incredibly powerful. Power, it, it, it's powerful in a good way. But I think what at the same time we also need to keep in mind is is that power can sometimes be used for other purposes, um, and and sometimes not necessarily good. And and what we're beginning to see, I think, in the twenty the 21st century, particularly in the second, should I say, third decade of the 20th, 21st century, is countries using football for self-interest. And, and immediately, as I'm saying this, I'm, I'm thinking about, for example, China. <clears throat> and China is very active uh, in, in Africa through a policy of stadium diplomacy, for instance. And what China is in the business of doing right now is to gift stadiums for nothing to, to African nations, very often as venues for the African Cup of Nations. And, and again, you know, to, yet what China is trying to do is, is to gain access to 
raw material supplies from African nations, particularly oils, but also you know, copper and, and magnesium and, and you know, the kind of elements that you need to, to use in the manufacture of mobile phones. And the way in which they do this is to use stadium diplomacy. And, and again, strategically, you might think, ah, that's a very shrewd move. But you know, to take a more cynical view, you know, it's essentially appropriating our game, the global game. But this is nevertheless very much part of the narrative that we're now beginning to see emerge. Just to give you another example, um, Qatar through the World Cup had a legacy initiative called Generation Amazing. And Generation Amazing is a football for development project. One of the, the, the target countries for this legacy project was, was Rwanda. So Qatar has made some investment into the promotion of grassroots football and, and sport more generally in Rwanda. What we've got to keep in mind, however, is, is that the Qatari government has just paid for the new airport in Kigali, the, uh, the capital of Rwanda. And Qatar Airways is trying to take a controlling ownership stake in Rwanda. And so what we what we can begin to see is is that it's not just China, it's Qatar, and but it's not just countries in the global south. It is also Britain, and it's the United States and others. And so there, what we're finding is that national interest, not just on the field but off the field as well, is being pursued through football, and this is clearly challenging the the global game in lots of ways. You know, for instance, governance, and and if we look at for instance, um, the current case against Manchester City that has been brought by the Premier League for the infringement of financial fair play rules, uh, we can begin to see how this infusion of, of, of football with you know, really nationally self-interested geopolitics is beginning, beginning to challenge what we think we know and, and certainly is beginning to, to challenge the, the governance of, of football. And I go back to your earlier point about Sepp Blatter and FIFA and the tipping point that we mentioned. We're going to find that UEFA is going to reach a tipping point. The Premier League is going to reach a tipping point. The IRC will reach a tipping point because we, we, we see countries that are not interested in their rules. Yeah, and I think you know, we see Manchester City and Abu Dhabi, you know, they, they, they want to challenge UEFA's rules. They want to challenge the Premier League's rules. They don't want to abide by them. They want to set the rules themselves. And, and, and so this is a real you know, kind of governance issue that, that will send us to a tipping point very soon. And it will eventually, it will, it will land on the doorstep of Central and South America. It will land on the doorstep of the United States. And, and you will have the same issues that the Premier League and UEFA and others are having now. But I certainly think that, that this third decade of, of, of the 21st century is going to be a pivotal one. And uh, thank you very much. And uh, the old fashioned way... Uh... Uruguay and Croatia through soccer have also projected soft power despite their size, population, and relatively weak economies. Um, are there other nations successfully using football to project themselves that don't have the financial resources, but uh, Morocco comes to, to mind. It was the, the team to watch during the last World Cup. Um, um, how essential is soccer to many governments and uh, smaller nations? Well, if we look at if we look at the World Cup, we think about Morocco, uh, and and as you say, this this representation of of the Arab world that the, they presented, and and I think perceptions around the world of, of, of the Middle East and North Africa have shifted as a consequence of that. You look at Japan and its fans. And I'm sure that many of your viewers will know the stories about Japanese fans and, and also the players themselves cleaning up stadiums, cleaning up the, the changing rooms after them. So what we now know is Japan has, it holds this value dear of cleanliness and tidiness and that's soft power. Uh, at the same time, if you think about Saudi Arabia and, and, and the stories go around the world about Saudi Arabia, about you know, what a bad country it is and, and all the bad things that, that it has done and we shouldn't trust its leadership. And yet when they beat Argentina in that first game, if you look at some of the social media content, for example, there was a, a great clip of Saudi Arabian fans dancing after the game. 
and 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 for a lot of people certainly in Europe this was this was a real shock because wow these people are real people they're real football fans they feel really happy when they've won and they, they even dance this is incredible so you know, really really uh, uh, football is a, is, a, is a powerful instrument of soft power I guess the example that I would use to round all of, of that office is 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 England you know, can you imagine what it's like to be English because but I can jump in a taxi anywhere in the world and sit in the front seat and say to the driver, what's your, what's your favourite Premier League team? And I can guarantee to you, 75 or 80% of them will tell you their favourite team and they will tell you why. Um, those who don't like Premier League teams will tell you exactly why they don't like Premier League teams. But it's a conversation starter. And that is the essence of soft power, is, is automatically we share an opinion, we share values, we have an outlook on something and that is soft power we're talking we're discussing uh, traditional working class football clubs uh, are very connected uh, with their own communities for decades and suddenly they find themselves owned by foreign entities and the premier league you mentioned the giant Man manchester city uh, was bought by the united arab emirates group and Newcastle is owned by Saudi Arabia, and uh, there are many examples like that. How does it impact from the point of view of the fan? Is it a good thing for their teams from their point of view? Is that you know a way of uh, uh, losing tradition in exchange for resources to keep winning? I guess the simple answer to that is 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 uh, for many football fans if if such investment is made in their clubs, then it's a fantastic thing. So if uh, if some oil-rich megastate buys your team or buys your club, um, then it's the most amazing thing that has ever happened. Um, but for others, it not, it's not necessarily the case. I guess at this point, it's important to to, to reveal my true true credentials because although I'm a a professor and 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 I, I pay attention to the geopolitics of of sport and, and football in particular. I'm a working class kid. I was born and brought up opposite my team's football stadium, literally. You know, the, the, the front gate of the football stadium was about 20 metres away from my house. Um, my team is Middlesbrough. And uh, there was a, there was a poll uh, about 10 years ago, the greatest Middlesbrough player of all time. And this was Juninho Paulista, Brazilian. Right. So uh, my, my club is solid, hardcore, blue collar, working class, steel town. Uh, this is where I was born and brought up. This is my heritage. And, and so my my club was always uh, the most important thing to me. It was a source of my identity. I went to my first game with my my father. It was it was intrinsic to my familial relationships, my friendship relationships, you know, what, what I did at school, who I talked to at school and, and so on and so forth. So I understand what it means to be a traditional football fan. But I guess I would say two things. The first one is, is the world has changed. So we're not living in the 1970s anymore. We're living in a very different world. And I think that is altering the dynamics of football for everyone, including you know, these kind of hardcore working class fans. What this means for me personally, the second thing that I would say, what it means for me personally is, is I've lost hope. You know, and 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 my interest in football has been diluted because my club, you know, thankfully, thankfully, my club is actually owned by a local businessman, and it, and it, and it's still very traditional in that respect. He he spends a lot of money on the club. Um, we're solvent. We are you know neatly run, efficiently run. But I know when you know we're never going to win the Premier League. We're never going to win the Champions League. We may never even get promoted to the Premier League again. And I'm happy that my but I'm happy that that my team's owner is a local guy because there's still some sense of identity there. But I do realize it's almost as though this kind of football is running out of time because, as I say, you know, Saudi Arabia and Qatar and others and the big money, you know, U.S. private equity investors. We haven't mentioned U.S. private equity investors. People people based in New York, in Chicago, in, in, you know, in Houston, in Los Angeles, who invest in football because they want to make more money, not because they love football. And so 
you know, I, I find myself now as a professional diving deeper and deeper into the game, but as a fan, actually pulling further and further away from the game because it's it's almost as though being a fan is futile nowadays. Simon, in the last minute that we have, um, just uh, very curious about your thoughts. You're the co-founder and co-director of the China Soccer Observatory. Tell us about um, China um, as uh, soccer as a sport nationally and its potential internationally. So, so China historically has not um, been engaged with football in any meaningful way either at grassroots level or, or, or more strategically at governmental level. Um, but of course, what we've seen since the emergence or the, the re-emergence of China into the international stage since the 90s is, is considerable interest amongst Chinese people in the sport. Uh, there, is a, there is certainly a big TV audience and, and I guess a social media audience too for, for, for football around the world in China. We saw some stars heading towards China in, in 2011, 2012. I'm thinking particularly here of Nicholas Anelka and Didier Drogba, who left uh, Chelsea to go and play in Shanghai. But it wasn't until President Xi Jinping became president in 2013 and, and then into 2014, when he announced, or his government announced at least, um, plans for China to become a leading FIFA nation. And so what that immediately led to is, is this almost like this gold rush. And, and what became very apparent is there was huge capital flight out of the country. So agents did very well. You know, South American and European agents did very well. Players did very well. Um, but football in China didn't. And so what we've seen from 2018 onwards is, is a reorientation of Chinese football strategy more towards grassroots football. And what we now have is, for instance, you know, something that's very common for people in South America and Europe is you play football at school. You know, in my case, you play football at school every single day you know, during, during your break times. Um, in China, there, there isn't that culture or there was, certainly wasn't that culture there is now. So it's a requirement, for instance, that across every school in China, there must now be football on the curriculum. So I think longer term, what we're seeing is a talent pipeline now being created and maybe, maybe around 2030, 2035, we will begin to see China become more of a potent force in world football. Chinese always say, the larger the ball gets, the tougher it gets for us. They're good at ping pong and they're having a, a tough time as the ball gets bigger. But thank you so much for the time you spend with us. You've been an excellent guest and uh, we really hope to have you back in the program soon. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's uh, been a real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.